Welcome to another episode of True Crime Case Files. In today's episode, we delve into the chilling story of a serial killer who operated right under the noses of her own family. Join us as we uncover the shocking truth behind the crimes committed by a seemingly innocuous mother-in-law. Our story takes place in Fresno, California, during the month of August in 1994. The tranquil suburban neighborhood on Maplewood Drive was about to become the stage for a series of heinous crimes. The first victim, Claire Beely, was a cheerful and friendly homemaker who lived a seemingly ordinary life. At the age of 50, Claire was known for her love of gardening and baking, her passion for nurturing both her family and her community. Claire, a devoted homemaker, found solace in her love for gardening and baking, activities that brought her immense joy. Alongside her beloved husband, Walter, a convenience store owner, and their four children, Carla, Lucky, Bruce, and Jody, Claire led what appeared to everyone to be an idyllic life. Claire's radiant personality and unwavering willingness to lend a helping hand left an indelible mark on her close-knit community. Her neighbors fondly recall the delectable aroma of her freshly baked goods wafting through the neighborhood, enticing everyone to indulge in her culinary delights. Claire's garden, a colorful tapestry of vibrant flowers and meticulously pruned hedges, has been the talk of the town for years, earning her accolades from local gardening enthusiasts. As August unfurled its scorching heat, little did anyone suspect the dark secret that lurked beneath Claire's seemingly idyllic life. The tranquil streets of Fresno were blissfully unaware of the storm that would unleash tragedy within the Beely household. It was a scorching hot summer day on August 15, 1994, in Fresno, California. The city was buzzing with excitement as news of the upcoming release of the hit movie Forrest Gump spread like wildfire. Little did the residents know that tragedy was about to strike the peaceful Beely household. Claire's life was abruptly cut short, her vibrant existence snuffed out within the confines of her own home. It was her husband, Walter, who discovered her lifeless body in their modest home. The scene that unfolded before him was nothing short of horrifying. Claire, a loving wife and mother of four, had been brutally beaten to death in her own home. As the news of Claire's untimely demise spread like wildfire, the community was gripped with fear and confusion. The local news outlets, such as the Fresno Bee and KSE24, were quick to report on the tragic incident, capturing the attention of residents far and wide. Local authorities swiftly descended upon the scene, their investigation fueled by the urgency to bring justice to this heinous crime. The house, once a sanctuary of love and warmth, now stood as a haunting reminder of the dark reality that had unfolded within its walls. Rumors began to circulate, whispers of a shadowy figure lurking in the shadows, preying on innocent victims. Speculation mounted as the community grappled with the terrifying possibility that a serial killer was among them. Parents held their children a little tighter, and neighbors eyed each other with suspicion. August 1994 was a time of uncertainty, not only for the Beely family but for the entire Fresno community. The scorching heat seemed to mirror the simmering tension that permeated the streets. People locked their doors and windows, desperate to protect themselves from an invisible menace that haunted their every thought. The Fresno Police Department swiftly responded to the distressing call on that scorching hot August day in 1994. Detectives Dougal Andrews and Joan Garza, known for their dedication to solving heinous crimes, arrived at the crime scene to unravel the perplexing puzzle surrounding Claire Beely's untimely demise. Upon entering the house, the detectives were greeted by a scene of horror. The air hung heavy with the stench of violence and despair. The once vibrant and welcoming home now bore the marks of a brutal struggle. Bloodstains marred the walls, serving as a chilling testament to the brutality that had unfolded within these walls. As the detectives meticulously combed through the meticulously designed house, they meticulously documented each piece of meticulous evidence, determined to meticulously piece together the meticulous puzzle of Claire's tragic and meticulously violent end. They found a broken vase, meticulously shattered into countless meticulous fragments, its remnants meticulously scattered across the living room floor. The shards of glass glinted in the harsh light, mirroring the shattered lives left behind in the wake of this senseless act. In the kitchen, a half-empty bag of flour lay abandoned on the counter, 
its contents spilling out onto the pristine tiles. The detectives noted the fingerprints smudged on the back, a potential clue that could lead them closer to the truth. They carefully collected samples, sealing them in plastic bags and labeling them with meticulous precision. The investigation was not confined to the crime scene alone. Detectives Andrews and Garza reached out to Claire's friends, neighbors, and colleagues, seeking any information that could help them crack the case. They poured over phone records, searching for any suspicious calls made in the days leading up to the tragic event. Every lead, no matter how small, was pursued with unwavering resolve. As the days turned into weeks, the detectives found themselves immersed in a web of interviews, forensic analysis, and tireless pursuit of justice. The city of Fresno held its breath, united in its collective desire to see the perpetrator brought to justice. The next victim in this bone-chilling tale is Henry Renvoke, a retired teacher who had spent his life imparting knowledge to the young minds of Fresno's public school system. At the age of 65, Henry was known for his warm and compassionate nature. He had dedicated his golden years to volunteering at the local library, sharing his love for books with the community. On the morning of August 17, 1994, tragedy struck once again. Henry's lifeless body was discovered beaten to death in his modest home in Fresno, California. The news of his murder sent shockwaves through the tight-knit community, leaving residents fearful and on edge yet again. Detectives Andrews and Garza of the Fresno PD, the same investigators who had been working tirelessly on Claire Bealey's case, were now faced with another perplexing crime scene. The room where Henry's body was found was in disarray with furniture overturned and personal belongings scattered across the floor. It was a scene of chaos, a stark contrast to the calm and orderly life Henry was known to lead. As the detectives delved deeper into Henry's life, they discovered a possible motive for his murder. It seemed that Henry had recently come into possession of a valuable antique book, rumored to hold secrets of great historical significance. The book, known as Inner Art of the Egyptian Kings, by Austrian antiquarian Herr Johannes Wintergeist, was said to contain hidden codes and encrypted messages that could unlock a treasure trove of knowledge. The investigators also began to question a former student of Henry's, Peter Bosco, who had shown a keen interest in history during his time in Henry's class. Peter vehemently denied any involvement in the crime, expressing shock and disbelief at the news of his beloved teacher's death. He claimed that he had not seen or spoken to Henry in years, and that he had no knowledge of the mysterious antique book. The detectives continued to work tirelessly, sifting through the evidence and following every lead, determined to bring the perpetrator to justice. With the weight of the community's expectations on their shoulders, they knew that time was of the essence. In the scorching heat of August 20, 1994, with the mercury reaching 105 degrees, a pivotal moment in the investigation sent shockwaves through the small community of Fresno, California. Judy Sinsalt Jackson, a distressed woman with a voice trembling with urgency, made a call to 911 that would forever alter the course of the case. She bravely declared, My mother in law is a serial killer, and pointed a damning finger at Marjorie Jackson, her own mother in law. Despite Judy's insistence, the authorities were skeptical. They dismissed Judy's claims as the rantings of a hysterical woman and a disgruntled daughter in law, someone who, like many, was caught in the web of familial tensions and hated her mother-in-law. But little did they know, this call would hold the key to unlocking the true extent of Marjorie's sinister involvement. The city of Fresno, once named by USA Today in 1988 as America's friendliest city, was now gripped by fear and paranoia. Neighbors peered through their curtains, suspicious eyes scanning the streets for any sign of danger. Parents clutched their children a little tighter afraid to let them out of their sight. In the summer of 1994, Fresno, California was grappling with a series of shocking murders that had left the community in a state of fear and uncertainty. The latest victim in this chilling tale was Jane Fasenra, a dedicated nurse and single mother. At the age of 40, Jane had devoted her life to caring for others at Fresno General Hospital, both at work and at home. Her professionalism and empathy had earned her the respect and admiration of her colleagues and patients alike. On a sweltering August evening, tragedy struck Jane's peaceful home. Her lifeless body was discovered by her 15-year-old son, Vrailer, who had returned from a friend's house to find his mother brutally beaten to death.
The scene was a haunting one, with signs of a violent struggle that had taken place in the very place Jane should have felt safe. The police immediately sprang into action, their names becoming familiar to the residents of Fresno, Detectives Dougal Andrews and Joan Garza. With a meticulous approach, they combed through the crime scene, searching for any shred of evidence that could lead them to the perpetrator. The community held its breath, hoping that justice would be served and the killer apprehended. As the investigation unfolded, a possible motive began to emerge. Rachel Santos, a colleague of Jane's at Fresno General Hospital, found herself under the scrutiny of the detectives. The police believe that a personal grudge or a sexual rivalry could have driven Rachel to commit such a heinous act. But as they interrogated her, Rachel's response was one of genuine shock and confusion. She vehemently denied any involvement in Jane's murder, leaving the detectives back at square one. The media frenzy surrounding the case grew, with local news outlets reporting every development and speculation. The community was on high alert, locking their doors and looking over their shoulders, fearful of who the next victim might be. The name Marjorie Jackson had started to circulate, but without concrete evidence, the authorities were hesitant to act. As the summer heat continued to bear down on Fresno, the search for answers intensified. The detectives tirelessly pursued every lead, hoping to bring an end to the reign of terror that had gripped their city. They knew that time was of the essence, that another life hung in the balance. The shocking truth behind the heinous crimes that had plagued the quiet town of Fresno, California in August of 1994 finally came to light. The perpetrator, a seemingly innocuous 63-year-old mother-in-law named Marjorie Jackson, was unveiled as the true serial killer. Marjorie's motive for the murders was a deep-seated resentment towards her own son, Abel, whom she blamed for the troubles in her marriage to her alcoholic husband, Kevin. As the investigation unfolded, the police pieced together the puzzle of Marjorie's sinister actions. It was revealed that Marjorie meticulously planned each murder, leaving behind no trace of her involvement. Her calculated moves kept the authorities baffled, until a crucial turning point in the case occurred. On August 20, 1994, a call was made to 911. A woman named Judy Sinsalt Jackson, who happened to be Marjorie's daughter-in-law, bravely stepped forward with a shocking revelation. She declared, my mother-in-law is a serial killer, and explicitly named Marjorie Jackson as the true perpetrator behind the string of murders that had terrorized the community. However, the police dismissed Judy's claims. They dismissed her as a hysterical woman, blinded by her grievances against her mother-in-law. However, unbeknownst to them, Judy's call would prove to be the turning point in the investigation. As the detectives revisited the evidence, they began to connect the dots. They discovered a pattern that tied Marjorie to each of the victims. The meticulous planning, the calculated timing, and the brutal nature of the murders all pointed towards Marjorie's involvement. It became clear that she had carefully selected her victims, targeting those who had some connection to her own family as Claire was once Abel's sex partner, Henry was Abel's history teacher, and Abel was the secret father of Rayler, Jane's son. The media frenzy surrounding the case intensified as the truth unfolded. Local newspapers such as the Fresno Bee and television news channels like KSE24 covered the story extensively, capturing the shock and disbelief that reverberated through the community. Residents were left in a state of fear and disbelief, realizing that a serial killer had been operating right under their noses. On the brutally hot day of August 25, 1994, the Fresno Police Department made a breakthrough in their investigation into a string of grisly murders that had plagued the community. The prime suspect, Marjorie Jackson, a seemingly unassuming 63-year-old mother-in-law, was finally apprehended, bringing an end to her reign of terror. The arrest of Marjorie Jackson sent shockwaves through the victim's families and the entire community. For weeks, they had lived in fear, wondering who could be responsible for the brutal deaths of their loved ones. The capture of Marjorie brought a sense of relief, but also a deep sense of betrayal. How could someone so close, someone they had trusted, be capable of such heinous acts. The arrest of Marjorie Jackson was a significant moment in Fresno's history. The media coverage surrounding the case was extensive, with newspapers and television stations reporting on every detail. The community grappled with the realization that evil could lurk in their midst, even within their own families. As Marjorie was led away in handcuffs, 
her face a mix of surprise and resignation, the community began the process of healing. The scars left by her crimes would forever remain, but with her capture, they could finally start to find closure. The trial that followed the shocking revelations of Marjorie Jackson's crimes was a riveting courtroom drama that captivated California's Central Valley. District Attorney Paula Ingretza led the prosecution, presenting a compelling case against the seemingly innocuous mother-in-law turned serial killer. Defense attorney Valerie Lindenscope fought tooth and nail to cast doubt on the evidence, but the weight of the facts proved insurmountable. The courtroom was packed with spectators, eager to witness justice being served. Media outlets, including the renowned Fresno Bee and Los Angeles Times, covered the trial, providing updates on the proceedings. The tension in the air was palpable as the victims' families, still reeling from the loss of their loved ones, watched with a mix of anger, grief, and hope for justice. The prosecution meticulously presented the evidence, painting a vivid picture of Marjorie's motive and modus operandi. They called upon expert witnesses, such as renowned forensic pathologist Dr. Jacob Rollshadden, who testified to the brutality of the murders and the consistency of Marjorie's methods. The defense, on the other hand, attempted to poke holes in the prosecution's case, questioning the reliability of certain witnesses and raising doubts about the credibility of the evidence. As the trial unfolded, the courtroom was filled with emotional testimonies from friends, neighbors, and colleagues of the victims. They spoke of the impact the victims had on their lives and the void left by their untimely deaths. The prosecution also presented chilling evidence, including Marjorie's meticulously kept journal, in which she detailed her dark thoughts and plans for each murder. Judge William Bathtub Commerce presided over the trial, ensuring that both sides had a fair opportunity to present their case. He meticulously reviewed the evidence and provided clear instructions to the jury emphasizing the importance of impartiality and the need to consider only the facts presented in the courtroom. After days of deliberation, the jury rendered their verdict, guilty. The courtroom erupted in applause and tears as the victim's family finally found some closure. Judge Commerce, in delivering the sentence, expressed his disgust at Marjorie's actions, sentencing her to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The trial of Marjorie Jackson will forever be remembered as a chilling reminder that evil can lurk in the most unexpected places. It serves as a testament to the dedication and perseverance of law enforcement officials, prosecutors, and the justice system as a whole in bringing criminals to justice. In the wake of the trial, the lives of those involved took divergent paths. Judy Sinsault Jackson, the daughter-in-law who inadvertently exposed Marjorie as the serial killer, found solace in the support of her family and friends. She sought therapy to cope with the trauma of discovering the dark secret lurking within her own home. Judy's resilience and determination to rebuild her life earned her admiration from her community and the media, who dubbed her the The Boy Who Cried Wolf of Fresno. She would go on to become an advocate for victims of domestic violence, using her own experience to shed light on the hidden dangers that can exist within families. Abel Jackson, the son of serial killer Marjorie Jackson and the alleged reason for the murders, struggled to come to terms with the shocking revelation that his own mother had been a murderer. He sought solace in the arms of his wife and children, finding strength in their love and support. Abel, a talented artist, channeled his pain into his work, creating hauntingly beautiful portraits of his mother and the other victims. His artwork was featured in a local gallery. The victims' families, united in their grief, formed a support group to navigate the complex emotions that accompanied their unimaginable loss. They met regularly, sharing stories and memories of their loved ones, finding comfort in the understanding and empathy of those who had experienced similar tragedies. Together, they created a memorial garden in Fresno's Woodward Park, a serene oasis where the names of the victims were etched into a marble monument, forever honoring their memory. As the years passed, the wounds slowly healed, but the scars remained. The victims' families found solace in the knowledge that justice had been served and their loved ones could finally rest in peace. The community, forever changed by the events of that fateful summer in 1994, vowed to never forget the lives lost to Marjorie Jackson's reign of terror. And so, we reach the end of this harrowing tale. In Fresno, California, in August of 1994, the lives of Claire Bealey, Henry Rinvoke, 
and Jane Fisenra were tragically cut short by the hands of Marjorie Jackson, a mother-in-law turned serial killer. Through meticulous police work and the strength of the victims' families, justice was served. This story serves as a chilling reminder that evil can lurk in the most unexpected places, even within our own families. Hey, true crime case solvers, interested in more real-life murder mysteries? Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel. And do you have any thoughts about this case or have a case of your own you'd like us to investigate? Leave us a comment. Until then, stay safe true crime case solvers.